Well, it's good to see you, and it is a little different. We want to pray for Jeffrey. A lot of your uh, junior... And uh, a lot of our people in the medical industry uh, do take risk. It's part of what they do. Jeffrey's a chaplain at uh, Baptist Hospital, and so like most people in hospital settings, they're dealing with COVID on a day-to-day -day basis. So I uh, want to pray for him. He said, Dad, I can come lead worship. I'll just stay away from everybody. I said, no, you just stay home and get well. I think he's going to have a COVID test today. But this is just part of the medical community. This is what they deal with. And so um, I appreciate you being understanding. It's a good time to pray. Let me ask you to take your Bibles. I want you to take them and turn to Proverbs chapter 4. Oh, go over there in the Old Testament. Proverbs chapter 4, right past the book of Psalms. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. If you don't have a Bible, let me encourage you to grab that Bible there in front of you. Then I want you to, once you get there, I want you to say amen. Okay, so Proverbs 4, 23. How many of you are there? Okay. Okay, and the rest of you will put you in Bible drillers so that you'll learn how to get there quicker. Okay, then from there, I want you to hold your finger there and I want you to go over to uh, 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, get over there past Hebrew and James. You'll come to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. So hold your finger there, Proverbs, or put your little uh, ribbon there or something. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Now, today I'm going to read two passages, and we're dealing with a subject. I, I titled this message, Why Do I Behave the Way I Do? Okay, why do I behave the way I do? Why am I the way I am? Uh, years ago, Sheila and I, we were getting ready to go to Zimbabwe. We... Uh, the family had a big reunion, had a big get-together at my parents. Many of you who know me know that my mom had some psychiatric issues, and my mom seemed to have problems a lot of times when the family came together. Well, anyway, both my sisters, their families, my brother, uh, my dad, my mom, we were all together, and it was a send-off. In other words, we were getting ready to leave, go to Zimbabwe, Africa as missionaries, and our first time would be like four years. So we were going to be away from the family about four years. And so this was really important. Well, as the meal progressed and things were going along, eventually my mom had a meltdown. My mom just lost it. She had a meltdown. And when she lost it and she had a meltdown, it just blew up like our families do. I know your families don't have these kind of problems. You come out of really good families that they never have no problems or difficulties. But your preacher's family, your pastor's family, we, we have some difficulties. And so the fam it blew up. It blew up into this confrontation. Everybody was screaming and hollering at one another. Now, Sheila and I, we weren't because uh, we were just wanting everybody to get along because we were getting ready to leave for a long time. And then everybody was driving off, speeding, throwing gravel. Everybody, you know, took it out on their vehicles as they were driving away. I went to look for my mom. My mom was on the side of the house. She was taking her fist and beating the brick wall. And she was crying and saying, God, why am I like this? Why do I do this? You know, the reality is for all of us, about 40 years of counseling, don't you think sometimes we look in the mirror and we go, you know, why do I do that? Why do I behave the way I do? Why do I act that way? Why do I seem sometimes to sabotage families or relationships or get together? You know, why can't I learn to control me? You ever say something, you go, man, I wish I could take that back. I wish I hadn't said that. Why did I say that? What made me say that? You know, it's just the way we are. And, and listen, let me tell you, I, I realize children are in here, but do you realize we're baptizing children every week? So listen, it's a small price to pay. If, if, uh, if Charlie or David or some of our younger guys, if they get Edith, if they get too upset, then mom, just bring them up here and we'll let them, we'll let them preach. You know, 
They probably have something to say anyway. Out of the mouth of babes, didn't God say that? Comes his praise and his worship, his word. Well, anyway, let's look at Proverbs 4, 23, because that's the subject, that's the title today. And, and I would love for this to be a little more intimate, even with the children playing and kind of running around. In Proverbs 4, 23, watch this. In the NIV, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Now let me read it again. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Now from there, hold your finger there, go to 1 Peter chapter 1 beginning at verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance. Now listen to this. And into an inheritance. Am I too loud? I feel like I'm a little loud. Okay. And into an, inherit an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. Okay, did you get that? It's an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, that is, kept in in, that is kept in heaven for you. Let's pray again. Lord, we thank you. We love you. We give you glory for what you're going to do today. Lord, cleanse me. Lord, forgive me for any thought, any deed, anything out of my mouth. Let me be a tool in your hand. Cleanse us as a congregation, Lord, and may we hear a word from you. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You know, I asked Sheila a little while ago, sitting in the office there, I said, Sheila, why did you come today? I thought maybe she'd say, well, because I'm the pastor's wife, I got to come. She didn't say that. She said, you know, I come, she said, she began to smile. She said, I love the fellowship. I love being in the fellowship of God's people. I love that. And then she talked about that. And then I said, is there any other reason? And she finally said this. She said, well, I also came because I want to hear a word from God. Let me ask you something. Did you come today? to hear a word from God. Does God have something that he wants to say to you today that may be very clear that he may never say again? Well, let's go back to that question. Let's go back to my mom's question. My mom died of throat cancer. I led my mom to Christ on her deathbed. My mom prayed to settle her salvation, to know that she's saved, and I believe one day when I get to heaven, I'm going to see my mom. But my mom raised a great question as she was beating the wall, bloodying up her own hands, till finally I said, Mom, don't do that, don't do that. And I had to pull her away from that wall. Why do I behave the way I do? Why am I the way that I am? And I thought about these two verses of Scripture. Alexander McLaren said this. He's a great theologian, on the, especially in some of his writings, a great preacher. Listen to what he said about these two verses that we just read. He said the former of these, that's Proverbs 4.23, above all else guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. He said that. He said the former of these texts, Proverbs 4.23, imposes a duty, a responsibility. The latter, 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5, let me read it again. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in his great mercy. He has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now listen to this. And into an inheritance that never perishes, never spoils, never fades, an inheritance that is kept in heaven, listen, for you. Alexander M McLaren said this. He said the first verse, Proverbs 4.23, imposes a duty, a responsibility. The latter, the latter verse promises divine help to perform that duty, that responsibility. Now stay with me. This sermon's a little deeper. The relation between them is the relationship between the law and the gospel. The law commands, the gospel gives us power to obey. The law pays no attention to man's weaknesses. It points the finger to you and I, and it tells us what to do. Its office is set forth. It just simply gives us a command. It doesn't help us in completing or fulfilling that command. It's a duty. Doubtless, he said this, McLaren said this, it's a chilly one. 
In other words, it's the old statement. You remember the, the, the statement in the Reagan years about drugs? Just don't do it. You know, but we look and we think to ourselves, well, that's easier said than done. The moralist, he, said, he went on to say, the moralist has hammered away at preaching self-restraint and a close watch over the fountain of the actions within the beginning. But their exhortation has little, inf it has the little effect because it doesn't tell us how to do it. How do you live out the Christian life? How do you discipline and watch over your heart? You need the indwelling Holy Spirit to help you do it. That's what McLaren is saying here. And so I wrote this down, number one, without guarding our hearts, without guarding our hearts, noble life and Christian life is impossible. God has called you and I. You know, this right here, Wednesday night I was teaching on Job. And I said, you have to understand, this is Job's life. Job is protected, guarded. He has the perimeter. He has the wall of God around him. Then all of a sudden, in heaven, and God is transcendent. It means God is above his creation, outside of his creation. God is on his throne. Satan comes along and he says, and he's standing there to give a report. And God says, Satan, where have you been? Satan said, oh, just, uh, Lauren, you said it Wednesday night. Satan looked like a teenager, all oh, just roaming to and fro, kind of messing around. And God says, well, have you considered my servant Job? And Satan goes ballistic. He said, well, hey, he ought to serve you. You pay him to serve you. You've given him. You've given him 10 children, ox, cattle, and a massive estate. You've protected him. And what he said here, and listen to what Satan said. Satan said, you have put a wall around him. I can't get to him. You know what God says? Take your best shot. Now he's vulnerable. The wall of protection, the perimeter that God had put around them is taken away. You see, Satan had slandered Job to God, and in some ways he slandered God to Job. He said, you've got to pay him. You've got to bless him. You've got to give him a lot of stuff. And if you take some of his stuff away and some of his blessings, he will curse you. And so here's Job. And guess what happens? All of a sudden, one messenger after another. Camels. Messenger comes and said, all your camels have been taken by the Chaldeans. All your oxen have been taken. Sheep are gone. Everything is gone. And finally, the last servant comes in, and he says, I've got some really bad news. And a family gathering with all ten of your children and all the family, they were killed. A storm blew through, brought the house down, and they all died in this storm. This is Job. <sighs> Another meeting in heaven. Satan, where you been? Oh, just messing around. You still, uh, you consider my servant Job? He's blameless. There's no one like him in all the world. <laughs> he ought to be. God says, you've taken, you've, you've taken everything. He's lost everything. And yet he's not denied his integrity. He still worships me. He still loves me. And you know what Satan says? Skin for skin. Man will do anything to save his life, save his own skin. He'll do whatever he has to do. But let me, let me attack his health. And then Job is literally in festering sores, looks like a leper. And he finally is just collapsed. And the Bible says he takes a piece of broken pottery and he's just scraping. And you know what his wife says? Why don't you curse God and die? She says this, why do you hang on to your integrity, curse God, and die? And he said, woman, you speak like a fool. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And he still does not deny 
his integrity. The picture that we have here, and I want everyone to listen, the picture that we have here is not only the protection of God. Satan can only attack you if, Satan, if God allows it. Satan may go about like a roaring lion, but he's on God's chain. If Satan comes into this boundary, if he comes into this walled-in fortress and you feel something, it's first come through God before it ever got to where you're at. Remember, he holds you in the palm of your hand, his hand, and no man can pluck, it, pluck you out. Listen, no man means you. You can't pluck you out. This is eternal security. But this is also a picture of your heart and my heart. This is what the writer of Proverbs was saying. He was saying, listen, your heart... Be on your guard. And with all diligence, guard your heart because out of it flow, it's a wellspring of your life. It is the command center of your life. It controls how you make decisions. And guess what Jesus Christ did when he came into your life? He came into your life and he came into your what? Your heart. And his Holy Spirit is now living in your heart if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. And God says, now I've entered in, you and I, Jesus is now in here. And he said, listen, what we've got to do, we've got to change your heart and it's a painful process. It's going to hurt. And I'm going to use your conscience. Your conscience is sitting here. And sometimes your conscience is going to say, don't do that, don't say that, don't go there, don't watch that, don't listen to that. That's your conscience. And the Holy Spirit is like a tag team match. The Holy Spirit comes alongside of your conscience and empowers your conscience. Conscience. So all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit is convicting your heart and saying, don't go there, don't do that, don't say that. If you're a parent and you're coming down too hard, sometimes the Holy Spirit says, stop, back off. You're going too far. So the Holy Spirit and your, and your conscience are there. And, and, and hey, listen, you are there. That is self-restraint. The Bible tells you, set your heart apart. The Bible tells you and I, search your heart. The Bible tells you and I, we have a responsibility in all of this. And then this is the fellowship of the body of Christ. This is the church. My conscience, the indwelling Holy Spirit, me and you. And we're all involved in protecting my heart. My responsibility, family, is to protect the heart of Amelia above all else. And so the writer of Proverbs said this. He said, listen. He said, with all diligence, search your heart, watch over your heart, guard your heart, because you cannot live the Christian life without a heart change the Old Testament, the heart was the center of the personal being. It was the seat of the emotions, the seat of the will. Alexander McLaren went on to make this statement. He said, as the text says, the issue of life flows from it, meaning the stream parts into many heads, but it has one fountain, and the fountain is your heart. If you ever go to an airport, you see the, uh, you, you see the control tower, the watch tower. The responsibility of that tower is to guide and direct planes that are landing and taking off. Think of your life and think of your heart kind of like that. Everything that comes into your heart, comes into your life, comes into your heart, has to be given clearance. Your heart is the control tower. Your heart is the watchtower. Your heart has the responsibility. Your heart is determining what comes into your life, what comes into your marriage, what comes into your friendships, what comes into your family, what comes into your home, what comes into your neighborhood, what comes into your country, what comes into the world. Satan did listen. Satan just needed Eve's heart. If he could get into Eve's heart, he could affect all of creation. Your heart is your watchtower. It's the control tower. It's the control center. And you're guarding it with everything in you. And there's sometimes that the Holy Spirit and your conscience teams up together to say to you in your heart, you don't need to go there. You need to leave right now. You ever have that moment when the Holy Spirit says to you inside you, you need to leave now. You need to leave now. 
Proverbs 4.23 is important. Because Proverbs 23.7 says this. It says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he or her. We are what we think. The Roman emperor Marcus Aurelius said this. He said, we become what we think about. The heart is the man or the woman. One writer said, the personal sinner, your heart has a moral character which comes to light, gives unity and character to everything that you and I do. Our heart controls everything. If a man is right in his heart, he does right. If a woman is right in her heart, she does right. If a man is to be right and do right, he must guard his heart. If a woman is to do right and be right, then she must guard her heart. Listen to this, parent. In fact, tell me what you think. I want every parent to listen to this and tell me what you think. And if you have something to say, I'm going to give you about three sentences to say it. Conduct, listen, parents, if you don't hear anything else, hear this, say amen. amen. Grandparents, say amen. Conduct is more easily regulated than character and less worth regulating. Okay, did you hear that part? Say amen. Let me read it again. Conduct is more easily regulated. In other words, behavior. Conduct is more easily regulated than character, but it's less worth regulating. Listen to this. It avails little to... Listen to this. You're going to have to put your thinking caps on to even get this. It's almost like a proverbial type statement. It avails little to plant watchers on the stream halfway to the sea. Control must be exercised at the source if it is to be effective. In other, words, in other words, what the proverbial statement means is this. If I'm halfway down the stream and I see pollution and trash in the stream, I don't address it there. I go all the way back to where it came in at the head. Some parents spend all their time trying to make their children behave. They just want them to act right. Just act right. Even a heathen can act right. They're just concerned about conduct but behavior. But it takes a lot more for a mom and dad to be invested all the way back there at the headwaters where we're talking about character. So let me read it again. Conduct is more easily regulated than character and less worth regulating. This individual went on to ask a question. He said, parent, are you disciplining conduct or are you molding character? In other words, you, are you more worried about conduct yet you fail to spend time in developing character in the life of your children? And there's a vast difference. You see, let me read it again. With all diligence, above all else, the supreme task of you and I is to guard and protect our hearts and parent, your responsibility is to guard and protect the heart of your child at whatever age. It is the responsibility of every follower not only to protect their heart, but it is also to protect the heart of the parent, of their child and those that have been entrusted into your care. Does that make sense? Last Tuesday, I was depressed. I'll be honest with you, I've been, I've been down. I think a little bit prophetically, grieving over this nation, grieving over what we'll look like a week from today. But Tuesday, I was down. I came by the office. I just looked at Willie and WH and said, Guys, I, I just need to get away. I said, I'm going to my mom's grave just to spend some time. There's something about going to a grave, a cemetery grave site sometimes to kind of clear your head. So over in Yazoo City, I went to the cemetery there where my mom was buried. I got out and I just walked around. I cleaned the grass off that headstone and just begin to talk out loud. As I was looking down at her gravestone and thinking, you know, God, I want to be a better man. I want to finish well. But I was so down. 
I left that grave. I walked over to my grandmother's grave because my grandmother had a great influence in my life. My grandmother filled some of the void that I felt in the problems and the issues with my mom. My grandmother filled that void. Some of you grandparents, you know what I'm talking about right now. And I looked at her grave. And then I looked at my grandfather's grave next to her. Then I looked at my Uncle Tom, who I was with when he died. He was 39 years old. He died of viral pneumonia, much like COVID. When he died, I, it was highly contagious. I rode with him in the ambulance because nobody else would. His wife was sick, his child was sick, and he was deathly ill. I rode with him to the VA. He died within 20 minutes after getting to the VA. I was the last one to have a conversation with my 39-year-old uncle before he died. He had changed my life and he called me to ministry. So I stood there at his grave for a moment. And then I went to see my dad and I, I said, Dad, he lives up in the hills out of a little community called Eden. I said, Dad, I, we visited a while. I said, Dad, could we go down to the old country church, that old church down in Eden, Eden Baptist Church? So we went down to, to the church, and my dad felt like I needed to be alone. And I walked in there, and I sat down in the same spot that I sat when I was 13 years old, and we moved from Florida to Mississippi. And I thought to myself, I thought, man, how quickly life Flies. I'll be 65 this month, and I thought, wow, it just goes so quickly. Your heart is the most valuable thing that you have. Your heart is the most fragile thing that you have. Your heart is the most powerful thing thing you have in your possession. I have a good friend of mine, Matt DeShazo. He's a heart transplant doctor. He takes out diseased, worn out hearts out of a chest cavity, sets them off, trashes them, throws them away, gets rid of them, takes the heart of perhaps someone in an accident, somebody's heart who's healthy, and he sets it in there. And I remember asking Matt, I said, what's it like? What's it like when in that moment life is in your hands, you've knitted this heart together, and then you wait for that moment, whether you stimulate it by hand, electrical current, ever how you do it. I said, what happens? He said, every, he says that the ER is on high alert for one thing. Boom, boom. That thump. That life. When all of a sudden you see that heart and it may be out of a teenager killed in a car accident put down a 50 year old man and all of a sudden that strong heart it, it, it thumps and it comes to life and all of a sudden blood moves through the body listen when you have repented of your sin and gave your life to Jesus Christ do you know what Jesus the cardiologist the divine cardiologist did he did heart surgery he took your disease, decrepit, sin-filled life, your heart, he took it out, he put his heart in you. Hey, listen, that's why he tells us to guard the heart. You know what we're guarding? We're guarding his heart. You know, I, I, I may not have time, but I've told this illustration before, but it's so powerful. A woman whose only son, 18 years old, was killed in a car accident. After they had pronounced him dead, his body was still in good shape. His heart was still in good shape. He was brain dead, but his body was alive. The doctor and the team came out and they said, listen, would you mind considering donating your son's heart? And they agreed to do it. The parents were just broken, but they thought if we can help somebody, they donated his heart. His heart was put into a 50, a guy in his 50s in Colorado. The wife, the mother, just simply couldn't, she just couldn't get over it. She just grieved and grieved and grieved. And her husband, who went back to work, he, he was trying to go on with his life, but he just saw mom just could not get over it. She just could not move beyond it. 
And so finally, this man called an organization that keeps up with donated organs. And he said, is there any possibility that we can find out who the individual is that got uh, our son's heart? And so they did research, and the call came one day, and he said, I just want you to know the guy lives, I think, in Denver, Colorado. He lives in Colorado. He's in his 50s, and uh, he would like to meet you. And so the, the husband and his wife, they flew out to Denver. They, they, got, they rented a car. They went to this man's home. They came to the door. They knocked on the door. And this man, nobody was there but him. He had set this time for this couple. And when they came in, the, the mom just began to cry. She just began to cry because she realized this man had her son's heart. She's just, she just crying, you know. And the husband is watching God do a work in his wife's life. You know, he's weeping too, but it has really affected mom. They let sit there, and she and the mom pulls out of all her albums and her pictures, and she's showing this man. She said, here he is. This is when he was born. And she would tell about his birth. And then she said, this was his first day at school. I cried. He cried. It was horrible. And she's just sitting there taking him through this 18-year-old's life, scanning and spanning the pages. At times she would just cry. He would cry with her. Then there came that moment. The husband looked at his wife and said, you know, we, he's been nice and kind. He's, he's taken, he's, we, he's, we've taken enough of his time. We, we need to go. And you could tell she didn't want to leave. He said, honey, we got to go. She goes to the door, and this man has been so gracious to him, and they fellowship together. They're getting ready to walk out. And she starts to walk out, and then she, she stops, and she turns. And she said, Sir, would you, would you mind? Before she could even finish this sentence, he opened up his jacket. He said, No, I don't mind. And that mom put her head against the chest of a stranger and she heard the heartbeat of her son and she just wept. When our creator God puts his head to your chest, does he hear the heartbeat of his son? Why do you guard that heart? Why do you guard your life? Why do you protect it? Why do you watch what comes into your life? Why? Because you and I have the heart of Jesus Christ. Why do you parent guard the life of your children? Why do you watch what they listen to? Why do you are careful? Why? Because you're guarding their life. The people that you love. You know what's sad about all this? Is for somebody to be here And this is you. And you know what I'm talking about. You've never repented of your sin. You've never allowed Jesus Christ to come into your heart. You've got a diseased heart. You sit there a lot of times and you beat the brick wall and you go, you know, why am I the way I am? Why do I behave the way I do? What happened to me when I was a little boy? What happened to shape my life and make me the way I am? Am I bruised up out of a blended, broken family? Am I bruised by parents who didn't love me, who didn't care about me? Am I bruised by friends and peers who were mean? Am I bruised by the, the, oh, the, this culture and this life? That what, What's made me the way I am? God, I don't want to be this way. I want to change. And Jesus Christ says, that's all I needed. And guess what he does? He says, Jeff, <laughs> all right, let's get started. I'm going to change your heart. I'm going to live in you. And when people put their head to your chest, they're going to hear my heart. Let's pray. I want you to stand and let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we just come to you right now. And Lord, I don't need to say a lot here. 
Lord, for everyone in this room, Lord, they know right now whether they are a Christian or not. They know whether they have repented of their sin and have come to that point in their life that they said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, forgive me. The Bible said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and will open the door, I will come in and fellowship with him and he with me. Sheila and I sat last night listening to a testimony, listening to a song on a telephone. I just wept. I thought about one day getting to heaven and seeing Jesus. I pray, dear Lord, if there's a man or a woman, a young person, and they look at their life right now, they've never been changed. They've got the same old sin-diseased heart in their life, in their chest. And, but this morning they're saying, God, why do I behave the way I do? I don't want to behave this way. I want to be different. I want to look like Jesus. And Lord, may they repent of their sin. What does that mean? The Bible says we change our mind. It's a change of mind. It's a change of heart. Metanoia in the Greek, 180 degree turn. And Jesus, when we repent of our sin and we cry out to you and we confess, homo legeo in the Greek, it says, homo legeo means to say the same thing about my sin that God says. When we cry out to God and confess our sin in that moment, Jesus Christ comes. We open the door of our life, we open the door of our heart, and we say, Lord, come in. And he begins to fellowship with us. Now we're in his care. He's watching over us. He's living in us. People begin to see strange things happen. Our behavior change. Our language changes. Our, what we listen to, the music, what, what, what movies we watch. It, it just seems like it just naturally comes. It's like a voice inside of us. The map is in us. The GPS of